steady stream, repatriation drafts leave the Western Theater bound for home. The first leg of the journey ends in the transit depot near Nijmegen, Holland. Debussing at the great collecting area, a typical draft of those lucky people have their documents checked and passed. Then, until time to move off, it's a question of just sitting around, dreaming of home, and waiting for the ride. Finally, the movement order comes through. Part of the first attachment loads its equipment aboard a plane. Their high priority allows them to travel to Blighty by air. They will touch down at a repatriation depot in southern England. The remainder of the group and trains for the port of Ostend. They are all set for a pleasant voyage across the English Channel with their destination also southern England. For purposes of movement control, several stages are necessary in the journey, but who cares when the eventual destination is home? In dear old Blighty, after going through a repatriation depot, the journey is continued northward by train. Scotland bound, memories of years spent in hospitable England are recalled. But the last look at its countryside is the best for homesick Canadians. of Gorrick, Scotland, one of the largest repatriation drafts yet to leave the UK, embarks for home. The giant liner Aquitania is among the ships commissioned to speed Johnny Canuck on his way to the land of the maple. In Halifax Harbor, a spirit of high fiesta with bands and cheers greets the returning warriors. The first step on Canadian soil is a great event after years spent away from the beloved native land. In Halifax, the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion is on parade. The CO of the 1st Canadian unit to return as a military entity receives the key to the city. Happy indeed are the people of Canada to welcome their stalwart sons who played such a noble part in the design of victory. In Montreal, Quebec, the annual Grand Parade is held in honor of the birthday of French Canada's patron saint, Saint Jean Baptiste. Boys and girls of many schools and clubs swell the ranks. Various religious and commercial organizations also march by. Dozens of magnificent floats are highlights of this year's parade. Sherbrooke Street is well lined with onlookers as the great spectacle moves slowly by. and other Montreal officials join in the festivities. Three thousand miles away, in Amersfoort, Holland, Saint Jean Baptiste Day is celebrated in traditional French Canadian style by the Regiment de Chaudière. The festivities commence with a parade through town. The many floats are made by various companies of the Chaudières. Prizes are given for the best float, so plenty of ingenuity has gone into their construction. Later in the evening, dances, sing songs, and a great fireworks exhibition are enjoyed by Canucks and their Holland friends alike. No need to duck for the slit trench tonight. The rockets are strictly made in Holland. The traditions of a young nation are remembered in the old world by the soldiers of French Canada. Holland, too, will long remember the festivities of French Canada's patron saint, Saint Jean Baptiste. It's tee off time in the 1945 Canadian Open Golf Championships. At Islesmere Golf Club near Montreal, the $10,000 tourney gets underway. On the first fairway, Byron Nelson plays an approach shot. He is followed by another noted entrant, Jug McSpadden. Record crowds of 25,000 spectators watch the play during the four days. They witness the game at its best, as well as shots painfully reminiscent of their own brand of golf. 
Bob Burns of Weston displays good form, and Ed Turgle of Detroit leads the amateurs, but Nelson's drives receive the fans' closest attention. On the ninth green, Islesmere's Stanley Horn comes through with a real grandstander, the envy of pros and duffers alike. Despite a near miss on his final putt, Byron Nelson sets the Canadian record for tournament play with a 72-hole score of 268. Doug McSpadden takes second prize with 278. To the winner goes the $2,000 first prize money. At Kitchener, Ontario, 400 members of the CWAC, including their famous band, polish their brass and stack their equipment in preparation for a journey to Germany. The band is inspected by Colonel Margaret Eaton, CWAC Director General. Composed of 47 musicians, it has twice toured the Dominion. On parade before moving off for overseas, the whole detachment displays all the military precision of a battalion of guards. After reaching the United Kingdom, the band is the feature of a garden party given at the home of Lady Astor at Taplow. The sweetest music this side of heaven puts a real kick into the lemonade and soda pop. During their stay in England, the band spends its time serenading the wounded at Canadian hospitals. At 11th Canadian General, an appreciative audience demands encore after encore. There is lots to go around because there's plenty of heat in them their horns. Swing with a feminine touch will soon delight the occupation forces, thanks to the band of the CWAC. At the Woodbine Racetrack in Toronto, entrants in the oldest Canadian racing fixture are posting. The Lieutenant Governor of Ontario represents the Crown as he presides at the running of the 85th edition of the King's Plate. Modern methods combine with age-old sporting tradition as the cream of Canadian thoroughbreds speed on their way to a coveted trophy. The outstanding event of the Ontario Jockey Club Spring Meet sees a great field trying for first place in Canada's Kentucky Derby. Fighting for rail positions are distinguished colors carried by the boys who are in there trying to boot home a winner for their own stable in the big event. Across the finish line in front of the grandstand, many lengths ahead of the field, the colors of the H.C. Hatch stable are carried to victory by a great horse, Ottermost, and a great jockey, Bobby Watson. Another King's Plate classic becomes history. <music> Leaving Brunswick, Germany, and traveling along the Berlin Autobahn, the Canadian sector of the Allied Occupational Force nears its objective. Positions originally occupied by troops of the USSR are taken over. Allied agreement allots them to the Western powers. Representatives of the 1st Canadian Army carry D-Day battle honors and those of the Italian campaign into a capital overwhelmed by Allied might. At long last, a conquering power views the scenes of a crushed city which fostered the legend of a Germanic master race. From the four corners of the earth, the empire rose to fight against the tyranny. Now with their allies, Canadian occupational troops view the shambles of the capital which once aspired to world supremacy. might translated to universal security, soon the banner of peace will fly over a world united against aggression. <laughs> 